Hello everyone, welcome to session 7 of LTech 654 Programming Games and Simulations. In this week's video, we're going to cover three topics. First up, removing children. Now, first I want us to understand the problem associated with managing the scene tree. Now, most of you in your session six assignments followed along wonderfully and created really interactive guided tours. Fantastic. Now, based on the tutorials I showed you, I actually introduced a problem, a problem on purpose. And let's actually see what that problem is. As you can see here in this video, notice the subtitle text is actually counting the number of children on the scene tree. And watch what happens as I advance next, 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 and back, back, back. As you can see from the video here, the number of children or the number of nodes in the scene tree is actually increasing. It's just going up and up and up. Now, this is a problem because we are using unnecessary computing resources. And so for our small projects, it doesn't really matter on modern computers. But with bigger projects or bigger games, games can become sluggish and they can slow down the computer overall. So in other words, you're wasting computer resources by not removing scenes when you don't need them anymore. So the point that I'm trying to make is that it's good practice to remove children from the scene tree when they are no longer needed. So how might we go about doing that? First, let me show you how I actually kept track of how many children were in the scene tree. So let me show you this little bit of code here. And I want you to take a look at line 53. You can see I have a function update child count. And what does that function do? Well, it does one thing, and that is line 54. It actually goes to the scene tree and it updates the text property of subtitle label, which we know is a child of header. And so it says header subtitle label dot text equals the scene tree has. And then I use a built in method called get child count that returns a number. So I have to convert it to a string. And then I just concatenate that with the string children, which gives me the scene tree has two children. By default, our program always has two children. Why is that? Well, the header already starts and the header itself is a child on the scene tree. Now the header has its own children, but we're not counting the children of header. We're counting the children of the root node. Now, of course, as soon as our code runs, we load scene one. And so we have both header and scene one as children of the scene tree. That's why we're seeing that the scene tree has two children. And each time we click next, we're adding a new child. So that number is growing and growing and growing. This is a problem. So how do we fix it? Well, let's take a look at this function I've written on line 56. It's called remove previous scene. Now I made up the name of that function. I could have called it anything I wanted to, but I called it remove previous scene. Now this code has only two lines in it, but they're two very important lines. Line 57, in this function, I create a variable. I named it previous scene. I could have named it anything I wanted, but then I'm telling Godot, I want you to get a child of the scene tree. And I'm telling it to get a specific child. What child do I want it to get? I want it to get the child at index one. Now, if we think about it, when our program runs, our header is already a child of the scene tree because it's built into the main scene. So that's the child at index zero. Keep in mind, computers start counting at zero. When we add scene one, that is the child that has index one. And so I'm telling Godot that I want the variable previous scene to be equal to the child at position one in the scene tree. And then in the next line of code, line 58, I simply want to remove that child from the scene tree. So I call the built-in function remove child, and then in parentheses, I tell it which one I want to remove. I want to remove the one that's stored in the variable previous scene. So those two lines of code are going to allow me to remove the previous scene each time I want to remove it. So the question is, when do I call that function? Well, I call that function anytime the next or back button is pressed. 
So take a look here. You can see on line 39, I have my on next button pressed function, which we know is connected to a signal. And on line 40, before I get to my if else statement, I call the function remove previous scene. And then again on line 46, where I have my on back button pressed, the first thing I do anytime that back button is pressed is I remove the previous scene. As a result, I can see that I can go forward and I can go back through my guided tour and the scene tree count stays at two, which is as efficient as it can be given how we've built this particular project. So that's a little bit about removing children. There are other ways to remove children, but this is a, a simple one that's gonna be important for future work that we do. All right, now I wanna talk a little bit about extending our work with conditionals. You all know that in this week's assignment, I introduced the idea of an if else statement or a conditional statement, and it was pretty limited. All that it allowed you to do was handle two conditions. If one thing was true, do one thing. And if another thing was true, do the other thing. So that was the if else. And you can see that code written here on line 39. If current scene equals equals scene one, then load scene two. If that's not true, do something else and load scene three. Now, that's pretty limited. And so what I wanted to do is show you how to work with L if. L if is short for else if. And if you take a look here at this extended code, starting on line 39, I have multiple statements or conditions using the else if or L if keyword. And so starting on line 41, you can say, if current scene equals scene one, load scene two. L if current scene equals scene two, load scene three. L if current scene equals three, load scene four, so on and so forth. What ELIF allows us to do is to check different conditions and execute different instructions based on which one of those conditions is true. Now you can see in line 49, I have an else statement as well. And so if none of those conditions, the if or the L ifs are true, then ultimately the else condition will run. And in line 50, I simply put print no next scene to load. And that would print out to the output console so I could know what was happening there. So that's one way to expand our work with conditionals. Now, another idea that I want to introduce to you is showing you that you can actually check two conditions at the same time with the AND operator. In Godot is written as ampersand ampersand. So take a look at this example, and this is based on the game Pac-Man. And so I have a function called check level status. And in that function, I have an if statement that checks two conditions. It says if pellets remaining equals zero and the time remaining is greater than zero, if both of those conditions are true, advance levels. Okay, and that makes sense. Once Pac-Man eats all of the pellets, so there's zero remaining, but there's still time left, that means the player has completed the level and should be allowed to advance the level. But the point is, is to look at how we're checking two conditions in one if statement. And oftentimes in games, we want to check, are both things true? And if they're both true, then do something. Now, you probably imagine that there is the equivalent of an and statement that comes in the form of an OR operator. In Godot, the OR operator are just two pipes next to each other. And so in line 16, I have check turn status. And so I'm checking two things here in this if statement in line 17. If Pac-Man is touching a ghost, if that's true, or time remaining is less than zero, I want to end the turn. In other words, Pac-Man's going to die because he touched a ghost or the game ran out of time. And so I'm gonna end the turn. Both of those things don't need to be true. Only one of them needs to be true. And then the end turn function will execute. Now there are times when you may wanna check a not condition. And so you can see here, I could say, if Pac-Man touching ghost is not equal to true, then do something. And so don't get confused if you ever see that exclamation point equals, that simply means not something. Now, one more thing that I wanna show you related to if else conditions is nesting if else conditions inside of them. 
take a look at this function on line 21, which is called check bonus status. And so here you will see there's actually an if else statement nested inside of an if else statement. So starting on line 22, it says if power pellet mode equals true and Pac-Man is touching a ghost equals true, if both of those things are true, then I go into that condition and I have another if else statement. It says if ghost remaining equals zero, award bonus and end power pellet mode. If ghost remaining is not equal to zero, then do something else. And what does the game do? It simply passes. Now in line 22, if the power pellet mode equals true and Pac-Man touching ghost also equals true, if one of those conditions is not true, then I would do something else. And what's the else condition? If I look at line 28, it executes line 29, which is end turn. And so this is an example of nesting if else conditions. And it's an important part of programming, more complex logic that is often needed for programming games and simulations. Now, one last thing that I want to point out here is really the importance of recognizing the value of quote unquote global variables. Most games and often uh, most programs will have variables that keep track of information over time. These variables are labeled global variables because any of the functions can access those variables and use those variables for calculations or for other decision making. So here I just wanted to show you, look at lines three through seven. Here are some examples of the type of global variables and their values that you might keep track of in a game. So for example, I have a variable called player name and it simply equals Sam. It keeps track of the player's name. I also have a variable called player health points, which starts the game out at 100. And of course, I might subtract player health points using that variable each time the player takes damage. And I have some other examples here, player gold count, player shield strength, and player sword strength. These are just examples of global variables that my functions could use in calculations and to keep track track of the status of the game. So working with conditionals and global variables is an important part of programming game logic. In this last section, I want to talk about where we're going related to all of this and specifically for our first game production project. So for game production project one, you are going to work in teams to create a postmodern lemonade stand. Now, if you're not familiar with lemonade stand, that is the very old classic business simulation. It was initially created by the Minnesota Educational Computing Consortium back in 1973, and it was a huge success and has led to countless examples and versions over time. If you're familiar with Lemonade Stand, it's a simple turn-based strategy game, and it simulates a child's lemonade stand where choices made by the player regarding prices, advertising, supplies, so on and so forth, determine the success or failure of the business, the lemonade lemonade stand. Now you're going to have the opportunity in your work to actually create a postmodern version of this. In other words, your simulation can sell anything. It doesn't have to be lemonade or even a beverage. The only requirement is that you stay true to the mechanics involved in a lemonade stand simulation. For your assignments this week, you're going to do two things. You are first going to form your groups and I'm going to ask for groups of four. And then secondly, what you need to do is play a version of the Lemonade Stand simulation and individually you're going to do a technical analysis of the Lemonade Stand to think about what types of information you would need to keep track of if you were to program your own version of Lemonade Stand. Okay, everyone, we're out of time for today. Have a great week and I'll see you in Canvas.